All right, Colossians. It took us three weeks to get through the first chapter. We're moving into chapter two. And you have to understand that Paul is writing to a church he's never seen. He's never met any of these people. And he has a love for them. You'll see in a minute, it says he agonizes over his prayers for them and the churches. He has a a love for God's people. And he is communicating to them the importance of a Christian life. And I've watched so many people get steered away, moved into wrong directions because they left the simplicity of what Christ has done and what a Christian life should be. They get proud, they start working on different type of theologies, they want to know things that nobody else knows. They're they're not living in the simplicity of how simple Jesus made the word, how simple Paul taught the word. And so this chapter talks about what's going on in the church, the people that are deserving, um, they were trying to take away from the Christians. They were, they were hurting their minds and, and causing them to walk away from their original faith. You know, they're, they're distorting the scriptures. They're, they're moving people into things that they know that nobody else knows or deeper thoughts and, and, and causing huge problems throughout the church and it still happens today. Let's look at chapter two, verse one. I want you to know how much I've agonized for you and for the church of Laodicea. This continues on with uh, verse 29 from the first chapter. This, this word agonized, striving or struggled. Agonized could either be an outward or an inward thought with fears within or w- without fears within. Here's the inward struggle, agonized, that's being spoke of. It's wrestling in prayer for the Colossian saints, saying in the battle without fear because of who God is. I think the biggest battle that goes on and the greatest gift we have for that is prayer. I think it's what we lack so much. God gets about two and a half minutes before we fall asleep or you know, maybe a couple minutes on Sunday or it just, it says pray without ceasing. You know, it means to have God on your mind, on your thoughts, on your friends. There isn't one of us, a lot of guys I know are nervous about coming on a Saturday for the men's prayer group. Well, I don't pray eloquently or I don't like to pray in front of people or there isn't a man in this church that shouldn't be able to come and not pray for our country, pray for Israel, pray for their family, pray for their grandchildren. Prayer's not hard. And we're called to pray for those things. We're called to lift those things up. Not because it changes God, it changes our heart. It puts him in the position that he deserves and it puts us in a place that we understand who we are. God loves our prayers and they don't have to be eloquent. They don't have to sound like anybody else's. It goes on to say, and for many other believers who have never met me personally, and it lets us know there that he's not met this church. And there's many others that are being affected by his ministry that he's never got to meet. But he prays, he agonizes, he thinks about them, he lifts them up to the Lord constantly without ceasing. It's not limited to just people that he knows. Neither should our prayers be. Verse two, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. You know, love knits people together It's why two different people can say the same thing to you. One of them you'll be totally offended and mad at. The other one you go, ah, it's just Tony. It's true. You just love that guy. It doesn't matter what he says or what he does. If I said the same things Tony said, I'd be crucified. Tony just loves people so much he can get away with anything. And it's our response to a person. I don't like that person. They said that to me. I'm offended by that. Or I love that person, and I know that they're great people, and it doesn't matter what they said. Love covers a multitude of sin. It just does. You don't get offended like you do when you don't love somebody. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan. We've been talking about this plan throughout the chapter, which is Christ himself. In him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
When we see the word all, and we're gonna see it a lot in this chapter, what does the word in the original language mean when we see the word all? Yes, theologians, every one of you. It's true. I always bring that up because we want to say, well, all but, but this, or all but that, or not this. Or not. When the word Bible says all, it means all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ Jesus. Not just some, but it contains all the wisdom in Christ. So to search for them outside of him is doomed for failure. Do you think you could know someone by a casual relationship? It's spending time with someone that lets you know them. If you want to know the truth about someone, spend time. If you want to know the truth about Christ, spend time. Spend time in prayer. Spend time in his word. All the treasures of wisdom are in Jesus Christ. You know, there's a story that I read years ago about William Randolph Hearst. And he's looking through a book of famous pictures, paintings. And he sees one, it caught his eye. And he says, I want that, I want that from my collection. So he said to his aides, go out and find it. I don't care what it costs, find this particular picture because I need to have it. If you value your jobs, you'll do this. Find this treasure, secure it immediately. Three and a half months later, the aides returned to Hearst. Did you find the treasure, he asked? Yes, he replied. After much searching and painstaking search, we found it. He said, did you purchase it? No. Why not, Hearst asked, because we found it in your warehouse. This is what Paul is basically saying to the Colossians. You already have the wisdom and knowledge you will ever need through Christ Jesus. It's all in Christ. When you got him, you got it all. You don't have to go looking in a warehouse for something that you already have. Verse four, I'm telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. In my day, I have ran into a lot of people that have well-crafted arguments. The internet is absolutely filled with well-crafted arguments. The History Channel is filled with well-crafted arguments that are absolutely lies from the bottom of hell. It's only the full knowledge and wisdom of Christ that keeps a believer from being deceived by these fine-sounding arguments. This is why we spend so much time in the Word of God. Flipping through the channels the other day, I, I hit something that started talking about what Christianity is, and they were trying to say that it was man-made to control human beings, promising them something after life if they'd be good in this life. And then they went on and on and on and on, and you know, that's just not good for my blood pressure. You know, they don't look at the miracle of the word of God, that there's no way what was spoken of in the Old Testament could happen if it hadn't been Christ. There's no way. It's not even mathematically possible. The, the amount of prophecies of who he would come, how he would die, what he would do, what he would say, before he ever came and ever did it, you couldn't have wrote something to do that. The Bible is literally impossible not for it to be true. But they won't look at that. They'll use this well-crafted deceiving that, hey, that sounds pretty good. And if you don't know the word of God, if you don't know the Old Testament, if you don't know the New Testament, if you haven't seen the prophecies, you go, hey, that, that sounds about right. Verse five, for though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should and that your faith in Christ is strong. You know, even though Paul's absent from the Colossians, He's overjoyed on how some of them have stayed firm, stayed fast, stayed solid in their, in their faith in Christ. He's getting reports on what's going on. Verse six, and now, just as you accepted Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Over and over, scripture tells us to walk. We're told to walk in light, Ephesians 5, 8. To walk in love, Ephesians 5, 2. In wisdom, Colossians 4, 5. 
And here we are told to walk in the simplicity of what God's done. We're to walk in Christ the same way re- that we originally received Christ. It was by faith. The Gnostic teachers wanted to induce some new truths for Christianity maturity, but Paul condemned them. You started with Christ, you must continue with Christ. It's exactly what Paul has written. You started with faith, you have to continue with faith. And this is the way to make spiritual progress in your life. Verse seven, he uses some things to illustrate that. Let your roots grow down into him. The rooted word here is an agricultural word. The tense of the Greek word means once and for all having been rooted. Christians are not to be tumbleweeds. You know, they're just blown by the wind of every doctrine. We're to set our roots in the truth. And let your lives be built upon him. Built up is an architectural term. It's the present tense, being built up. We trust Christ to save us. We set upon the foundation that he's given us. And from then on, we grow in grace. Then it goes on to say, let your faith grow strong in the truth you were taught. Christians who study the word become grounded in their faith. The enemy has a different time, you know, has a different, has a difficult time deceiving a Bible-taught believer. A Bible-taught believer knows when there's something false. I've shared it over and over again. If you want to know if a $20 bill is good, you don't look for bad ones, you compare it to a good one. That's what we do by knowing the word of God. When doctrine comes up, when the history channel comes up, when secular people come up and they try to sell you on things that are not truth, that sound pretty good, that are pretty fancy by some pretty intelligent people. They, they're religious, it's gotta be real. If you study the word of God, you know that it's not, you see that it's not. It doesn't fit the doctrine of the Bible. And you say, Pastor, why are you making such a big deal out of this? Because every cult member I've ever met of every cult religion started out in a Christian environment, some denominational church. And I'll share some things more as we go. It goes on to say, and you will overflow with thankfulness. You know, I think I get up every morning and I pray that God will fill me with the Holy Spirit. But I think the next things that come out of my mouth are thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the day that you've given me. Thank you for, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for loving me because I sure don't deserve it. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my children. Thank you that I get to live here. Thank you that, you know, that I have friends that I have. Thank, Lord, thank you that you, 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 you love me. And then I go on into praying for the people that I know. You know, it just, it's so easy to do, but we start with thankfulness because it puts us in the right place to pray. If we're always whining to God, oh God, it's such a bad, bad day. The world is terrible. I'm going to eat worms. What kind of guy would love that prayer? You know? And a lot of us sound like that. If, if you're spending a lot of time watching TV, you're going to sound like that. If you're watching the news 24 7, that's what's going to come out of you. You're just going to, it depresses you. And they know that. That's how they get the ratings. You ever notice that you don't hear a lot of good things? That doesn't stick to people like the news does. Find out what's going on in the world and shut it off and get into the word of God. Get into praising and thankfulness for your life. And you will overflow with thankfulness. The image is a river flowing, getting deeper as it flows. Sad to say, Christians, many of them, are not making progress here. Their lives are like shallow streams or dried up rivers instead of mighty flowing rivers. You know. The picture is that anybody that's been next to you is soaking wet because of who you are. The Spirit of God is so powerful that there's an image of just pouring out on anyone that you're near. That starts in the morning when you ask God to fill them with your Spirit. And then as the day wears on, ask them again, over and over again. The Bible tells us that we can continue to ask for that because in the world we live in, it doesn't take long to get to us. A thankful heart is, is a, a mark of a Christian maturity. 
when a believer is fully thankful, they're making progress in their life. By looking at these pictures of spiritual progress, we see the growing Christian can easily defeat the enemy and not be led astray. If the spiritual roots are deep in Christ, they will not want any other soil. If a Christian in their sure foundation, they'll have no need to move on and, and, and you know, they, they won't have to jump from things to things. They're planted. They'll know when false teaching comes along. If their hearts are overflowing with thanksgiving, they'll not consider turning from the fullness they have in Christ. They won't look for something better. They've already got the best. They have all in Christ. A grounded, growing, grateful believer is not going to get led astray. Are you living the life as a grounded, growing, grateful believer? If you're not, go in a different direction. Change the direction you're in. Verse 8, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Now Paul uses a military image in this warning. A literal translation would beware, don't let anyone carry you off as captive. False teachers did not go out to win the loss, nor did the cultists and the false religions today. They kidnap converts from churches. You know, as I shared, most of the people I know, I had this really good friend growing up, and he was a devout Catholic. Now, he couldn't tell you why he was Catholic. He didn't know what it meant to be Catholic, but his family was Catholic, his family was, there are phenomenal, beautiful Catholic people that get it. That's because they spend time in the Word. But many of us grew up in the Catholic environment where they spoke in Latin. We didn't even know what they were saying. Or we practiced prayers and we sat and we kneeled and we never learned the word of God. So we weren't prepared for false religions. We weren't prepared for someone bringing a doctrine that wasn't true. And I remember he met a girl and she was part of a, a cult religion. And he didn't have the ammunition to know that it was wrong. It sounded good. They were nice people. They did nice things together. They got more attention than he ever saw in his Catholic church. And he moved into this relationship, married this woman, and, and has had nothing but nightmares in his life because of it. It's because he didn't know the word of God. We spend more time in the word of God than most churches in America. Calvary chapels are very attractive to me because the way they study the word of God line upon line through the books gives you a knowledge so that you can know what's right or wrong. Many of the, the cults didn't go win people that didn't have any religious experience. They won people that went to church that never learned the word of God. They're ignorant of the truth of the word of God they become fascinated by the philosophies and the empty delusion of false teaching. It fits the flesh for a time. Now, this is not to say that all philosophy is wrong because Christian philosophy of life is the truth. And the word philosophy literally means to love wisdom. But you have to know the right philosophy. When the person doesn't know the doctrines of the Christian faith, they can easily be captured. Paul warns, warns the Colossians about new moons and other religious practices determined by the calendar that were related to this Gnostic's false teaching. One thing certain, these teachings about demons and angels were not part of the true Christian doctrine. And if anything, these teachings were satanic the way they were taught. In fact, these teachings are not Christian faith in any way, and it's warned to us in our faith to stay away from things like horoscopes, astrology charts, Ouija boards, and any other godly, ungodly practice. The whole zodiac system is contrary to the teaching of the word of God. The Christian who dabbles in the mysticism and the occult is only asking for trouble. And I've got tons of examples, and you've heard most of them, of things that have happened when people do move into those areas. Verse nine, and they're real. They're real. Take, make no question about it. 
They are real. A Ouija board doesn't move with nothing touching it for no reason at all. Satanic worship has power. It's demonic power. It's to draw you away from God. It draws many people to suicide once it captivates it. And I've seen it and I've experienced it and we've gone to homes where people were, were worshiping the devil and had the devil games that they were playing in their house and then got scared because of the things that were going on in the house. And we went in and prayed over the house, made them remove those things, take those things out of their house. I haven't shared for a long time, but we had a secretary when I had my business. It was my partner's sister. And she was in the occult. And I would share the gospel with her, and she was interested because of the numbers of the Bible and things like that, but she was definitely into the occult and the power of the occult. And so I gave her my favorite Bible one day, and I said, look, would you just read the word of God? And she came back and told me, gave it back to me, and said, night after night, I would put that Bible, after reading it, on the side of my bed, and all of my demonic books, all my occult books, were on the ground. And the Bible would sit there, and she goes, it's just freaking me out, take this thing back. There's, there is a power in there that you do not mess with. We have all that we need in Christ Jesus. We do not ever want to touch any of these things. Verse nine, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. You know, Jesus Christ was our way of knowing God. God was invisible to the Old Testament. When Jesus came in as a human, we were able to see the example of God perfectly. And, and that's how we measure our Christian walk, by what we see in Jesus. The false teachers in Colossae, and as false teachers today, ask the believers not to forsake Christ, but they ask them to make Christ as part of their new system. The Mormons will tell you that Christ is real and even use terminology of the Christians, but when it comes down to it, they will tell you that he was created, that he was a brother of Satan, and, and, and it's madness. You have to work to get them there to tell the truth of that, because they even know that'll be repulsive to the Christian. And you have to know the difference to be able to understand, because they've got a great story. It, it meets the flesh. They're feeding families. They're taking care of them. They're storing food. They're riding their bikes all over the place, witnessing. They're doing great things, it looks like, on the outside. But if you take God and what he did in human form in Jesus Christ and you belittle it down to something that he was created and a brother of Satan, that's madness. They would actually, false religions not want to remove Christ, but they remove him from his rightful place of preeminency. All, fu all fullness in Christ, and you've been made full with him. Why then would you ever want or need anything else? The word fullness means the sum total of all that God is, all of his being and attributes. What a deal we have as Christians. Verse 10, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Now the remarkable thing is that every believer shares that fullness, and you are complete in him as a Christian. Doesn't mean you're perfect. The tense of the Greek word indicates that this fullness is a permanent experience. When a Christian tells me I don't have any self-esteem, I always tell them that their significance comes from being a child of God. We have the fullness of God through Christ Jesus when we made him Lord of our lives. The fundamental test of any religious teaching is where does it put Jesus Christ? His person, his work. Does it rob him of his fullness? Does it deny him either of his deity or his humanity? If any of those things fail, you are looking at a cult and lies. Does it say that the believer must have some new experience to supply them with this experience of Christ? If so, the teaching's false. When Jesus said it's finished at the cross, it's finished. This new revelation from human beings 
that is supposed to supersede what Christ said on the cross? Are you telling me that you're saying that Jesus didn't know the future? When he said it's finished, he didn't know it wasn't finished? How arrogant for human beings to think that way. Verse 11, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical product. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. See, Paul's using circumcision figuratively here, and we see the Bible where that happens. Now remember the false teachers that threatened the Colossian church were made up of several elements, oriental uh, mysticism, astrology, bad philosophy, and Jewish legalism, all put together, um, and people ran to it. Gnostic legalism said that Jewish law would help the believers become more spiritual if they were circumcised, if they watched their diets, if they observed holy days, they would become part of the spiritual elite in the church. Unfortunately, we have people with similar ideas in, ideas in our church today. I remember a family in our church, well-educated in Christianity, find themselves in a, a Jewish church and then all of a sudden, we weren't allowed to call him Jesus. We had to call him Yahshua. And we weren't celebrating the holidays, and we weren't being holy. And we had to have church on Saturday and not Sunday. And all the legalism that came along with that. And, and it feeds our flesh, because if we feel like it hurts, or it's more painful, or it's more difficult, it's more holy. But it's not what God said. It's not what he called us to. Jesus alone is sufficient for every spiritual need. For all of God's fullness is in him. You keep repeating this, Pastor, because we need to know it. We are identified with Christ because he is the head of the body and we are the members of the body. Verse 12. So you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Here, Paul uses an illustration of baptism. Keep in mind, in the New Testament, the word baptize has both literal and figurative meanings, and I've watched people confuse that. The literal meaning is to dip or to immerse. The figurative meaning means to identify with. For example, the Jewish nation was baptized into Moses when it went through the Red Sea, 1 Corinthians 1.10. There was no water involved in the baptism because they went over dry land. In this experience, the nation was identified with Moses. They used the word baptized to be identified with. Paul uses the word baptism in a figurative sense also in this section. For no amount of material water could bury a person with Christ or make them alive in Christ. Water baptism is by immersion. It's a picture of a spiritual experience. When a person's saved, they're immediately baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ and identified with the head of Jesus Christ. The identification means whatever happened to Christ also happens to us spiritually. When he died, we died to our sins with him. When he was buried, we were buried our sins with him. When he rose again, we arose with him. We get all the benefits of what Jesus did on the cross. It was the power of God that changed us not the power of water. I came from a religious system that told us if you weren't baptized, you couldn't go to heaven. The Bible's never indicated that. In fact, it's clear here that it doesn't indicate that. Baptism is an outward expression of what you've done on the inside. That's what baptism is. It doesn't, and, and I use the example, you've heard it a million times, but I want you to have this in your mind when people bring it up. The thieves on each side of Christ. The one thief rejects Christ. The other Christ repents and asks for forgiveness. And Jesus turns to him and says, you will be with me in paradise today. Jesus did not unnail him off the cross, dip him in the water, and hang him back up there. There was no water involved at all. And it's important to look at the simplicity of things that religious systems have said that have no basis or no truth. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave 
all our sins. We see the word all again. And um, man, Christ paid the price for every one of our sins. It's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. The practical application is clear here. Since we are identified with Christ and he is the fullness of God, what else could we possibly need? Nothing nor should we put anything else in. We've experienced the power of God through faith in Christ. So why turn to the deadness of the law? God's forgiven us for all our trespasses, Colossians 2.13, so that we have a perfect standing before God. He sees us perfect. Verse 14, he canceled the record of our charges against us and took away, and took it away by the nailing it to the cross. Now Jesus not only took our sins to the cross, 1 Peter 2, but he also took the law to the cross and nailed it there also. The law was certainly against us because it was impossible for us to meet its holy demands. The law was there to show us that we needed a savior. The law was not bad. The law was God's standards. But we couldn't meet those. We couldn't get to heaven through those. It took what Christ did for us. You know, God never gave the Ten Commandments to the Gentiles. But the righteous demands of the law were God's holy standards. And he put it into the Gentiles' hearts. He puts the law into every human being's heart. They have to choose whether to obey it or not. Verse 15, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. You know, the death on the cross looked like a great victory victory to Satan at the moment, but it turned out to be a great defeat to Satan that he can never recover from. Victory is found in the word triumph. Paul uses a, um, a Roman general who won a victory on a foreign soil. He took many captives and all the loot, and he gained the territory for Rome, and he was honored an official parade known as a Roman, Roman triumph. Paul touched on this idea in his second letter to the Corinthians too, um, and he, he hits it here, the triumph that Christ has gotten. Christ won a complete victory there, and he returned to glory in a great triumph procession. Um, and and it, it, it looked to Satan by killing Christ, he was gonna win. Little did he know that by killing Christ, that blood would save you and me. Satan was disgraced and he was defeated. You and I share in this victory over the devil. We don't need to worry about forces that govern the planet or try to influence people's lives. The satanic armies and principalities and powers are defeated in this disgrace. We claim the victory of Christ and use the resources he provided for us. It's the full armor of God that we looked at a couple weeks ago and we trust him. We're free from the influence of the devil. You know, it's a wonderful position that's been provided to us in Christ. Now, are we living up to it by faith? If we're not, we're missing out on everything he's done. Verse 16, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. It's... It, when you read the word of God, why would somebody come back and say, you're not being holy because you're meeting on Sunday? When the Bible tells us very clearly we don't have to meet on Saturday. It says that you can have pork if you want and not worry about going to hell. That you can call him Jesus in love and not worry about calling him Joshua. It's very clear that you don't get hung up on these things that man wants to hang you up on. For these rules are only shadows of the reality to come. And Christ himself is that reality. See, in the Old Testament, there's all these shadows of the coming of Christ. We love them. We love the Old Testament for that. That's the proof that the New Testament's true. These were all pictures of Christ, but they were pictures. Silly illustration. If I returned from work and Valerie fell to her knees and started kissing and hugging my shadow, I would say, there's something shady going on here. Get up. You got the real thing here, baby. Hug me. 
You know? What, what do you care, you know? And that's what Paul's saying. These things people are hugging and kissing and holding on to are just shadows. The reality is Christ. He's the fulfillment of all the Old Testament rules, regulations, and ordinances. Once you have the reality of Christ, why kiss shadows of legalism? It doesn't make sense. Will that picture stay in your head? Not Val's. <laughs> Verse 18. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels saying that they have a vision about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. It makes me sad when I see people worshiping Mother Mary or saints or praying to saints. Saints don't hear your prayers. Mary, they were humans. One Mary should be honored. She carried Jesus Christ. She was chosen by God. But she's not omnipotent. She can't, she can't hear the voices. God can. And we pray to God. The Bible tells us very clearly that through Jesus Christ, we pray to the Father. Pray to the Father. We don't pray through saints. We don't do that. That's been really, it's, again, a hard thing for me to understand gigantic religious systems that don't see the simplicity. These are not Pastor Dave's opinions of the word. I'm reading it right off the pages for you. What do you do with these pages when you have these theologies? It doesn't make sense to me. Don't let anyone condemn you for these things. Paul says, watch out for mysticism. According to this passage, those who claim to be caught up in heavenly visions that speak about things that are not of the word of God, they possess cult-like mentalities. They meddle into things that are not of God. They become puffed up, and that's always what I see. Fleshly minded, people that claim to have something extra more than God has revealed. And time and time again, man, I hung out with a guy for years that all of a sudden started doing more internet searching of the word than he did Bible searching of the word. Then he started giving dates when Jesus was coming back. And then when that one didn't work, he gave another date. Three times going around and telling people Jesus is coming back on these days and these times. No one knows the time or date. The Bible's made clear. We can see the seasons and it's coming and it could be at any minute and nothing's keeping the Lord from coming back for us right now. And I hope he does. But we're to live as if he should come back at any minute. That should be our life. That should be our decisions. That's why it's put in place like that. But just to watch him come up with all this crazy, weird theology that he was finding on the internet that didn't line up to the word of God, taking a sentence here and a sentence there out of the Old Testament, building a whole crazy theology, becoming proud, and not even humble when he was missing it. Look, if I told you Jesus is coming back Wednesday and he doesn't come back Wednesday, don't you guys come back on the following Sunday? Do you know what they did to a false prophet in the Old Testament? They killed him. And yet it happens. And yet it happens because people allowed things like that into their life. They got puffed up on it or they were ignorant towards it. Stay in the simplicity of what God's done. Pastor, you're spending a lot of time on this. Too many people get deceived. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. I don't want you guys to be deceived. I want you to be solid, steadfast. Verse 19, and Paul wanted, this is what Paul's trying to get out of this church, and this is what we get out of what Paul's teaching. And it goes on to say, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints, ligaments, and grows it as God nourishes it. Now, you've probably seen what happens to a chicken when its head's cut off. It, it runs around with no sense. <laughs> and that's what people look like without Jesus, the head of their lives, the head of the church. They look like a chicken with their head cut off. You look at the world and you see the things that people are doing in the world. You know, um, it, it, it's madness. It's hard to believe a human being would do that to another human being. There, there's no sense, there's no headship, there's no Holy Spirit 
They're just doing whatever a mindless person does. Verse 20, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. Now this doesn't give us an excuse to be drug addicts, alcoholics, or, well, the Bible says, don't tell me not to touch or don't tell me not to drink. It doesn't say that, and that's not what it's saying. There were all these pious religious things that they were not supposed to do that had nothing to do with being a Christian. But as a Christian, we need to be responsible for how we handle the things that we do. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. They provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. The power of Christ in the life of a believer does more than merely restrain. It desires, you know, um, the desire of the flesh is there, but it puts new desires in a person, something better. Nature determines appetite. The Christian has a very nature of God within them, Second Peter, and this means that they have godly ambitions and desires. They do not need law on the outside to control their appetite because they have life on the inside, the Holy Spirit. The harsh rules of the false teachers caused humans to try in their own power to control their fleshly desires. Try to do anything in your flesh to control it. Almost impossible. As the worship team comes up, I want to finish with this. A Native American elder tells a story. He said, inside of me are two dogs. One dog is mean and evil. The other dog is good. The mean dog fights the good dog all of the time. When asked which dog wins, he paused and reflected for a moment and replied, the one I feed the most. The more godly ambitions and desires we feed ourselves with, the stronger Christian life we can live. What dog are you feeding in your life? What dog gets your time, your efforts, your thoughts? We have it all in Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear. When you have it all, why do you want to add anything else to all? It doesn't even make sense. Would you stand with me? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May your week with him be sweet tender. Father, don't let us get in the morning. Don't let these feet touch the ground until we've asked you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Powering us, Lord, to live a life. Live a life that you've given us that has all of you. What a gift, Lord. Help us to remember that. Help us to be appreciative of that. And Lord, help us to be thankful for that. And help us to be faithful in that, Lord. We love you, Lord. We pray for truth in the church today. We pray for church around the world, Lord. To speak your truth, Lord, to help people understand what you have for them. And the joy that comes from knowing that you've covered our sins, that we have eternity waiting for us. That it doesn't matter what's going on around us. That's where our joy comes from and that we share that joy with others, Lord. Make us powerful witnesses, and we ask these things in